You know, finding a partner that has really established relationships that they trust too are extremely important. We have heard some horror stories on this side of, you know, companies trying out different um, manufacturers and uh, finding some surprising challenges along the way. One of which was uh, a client that we'll actually hear a little bit from, um, Caitlin, who comes from Mantle Clothing. Not once, but twice did um, did she experiencing something just uh, we were just astonished by in more I'd than never one heard country. Of that yes, level of craziness. Yeah. Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane, and I'm Brett Schnitker. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward, and discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is produced by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. We are once again in the world headquarters of Stars Design Group, and Brett and I are joined by an extra special guest today, a third co-host, Iggy Pup, for those of you who are watching on our YouTube channel, will get to see our little mascot, the Yorkshire, the one and only Iggy Pup joining us. So if you hear some panting, it's not me, it's not Brett, it's the dog. That's right. <laughs> so today we are not here to talk about dogs and apparel, but we are here to talk about the complexity of apparel. You know, we've talked about it being a, a, a very uh, robust space with lots of areas where things can go wrong. And, you know, there's so many people involved in making garments today at all levels. That there's, there are a lot of opportunities for something to go along throughout the process. Knowing today companies are operating leaner and meaner. You know, you've got a lot of expertise that's retiring out. You've got younger people coming in wearing multiple hats there can be great value into bringing some outside expertise in to just help provide a little additional perspective and uh, help make sure things don't go off the rails too far before it's too late. So we're gonna kind of talk about all those little areas of, of opportunity today. I think we should kind of start at the beginning of it, um, some of the foundational uh, points of, 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 of a business. you know. We talk to a lot of aspiring new companies and, and startups and uh, or companies that are looking to scale or pivot. And Brett, you always give some staggering numbers there of you know the, the amount of companies that make it and those that don't. And one of the things that you talk about in ensuring success is? Good business plan. Yes. And I think that that not only, you know, uh, is applicable for startups, but every year, reviewing and analyzing a company business plan, I think continues to be important, especially with how, th how rapidly things are changing in the globe and the apparel space mm -hmm. today. Um, you know, the number that I always say is, is pretty rough. You know, it doesn't incentivize a lot of people to put tons of money into the industry as a startup, but it's an important part of, of understanding uh, how important it is to have your ducks in a row when you're launching a brand. You know, I think overall stats that we've heard is definitely 90% of the companies that start fail. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as we walk through the conversation today, there's a number of reasons why they do. It's not that they don't have necessarily a bad product mm -hmm. or a bad idea. They just don't have a good business plan and they don't understand the time and money it takes to to really build, uh, you know, reasonable revenue and profits to cover overhead and, right. and, you know, and all the investments included in starting up a brand. You know, you're, you're so correct. You know, time, timing can be important when, when going to market or making a shift in your plan. And, you know, also, you know, vetting out market need, where you fit in the market, um, all of these things are, are considerations in your business plan. And to your point, Brett, even well-established companies um, should be looking at those, those plans every year. We do internally at Stars yeah. do both a sales and marketing plan and really look at where we're sitting in the market and 
um, you know, where are areas of opportunity and, you know, where are some decisions to make that we could make better and all of those things are things as a company that really can make a big, big impact. Companies can get comfortable and complacent and the world can move past them. Right. And, um, you know, even Stars Design Group at one point had an sure. outside opinion come in to take a look at that strategy. Correct. Myself included yes. there. <laughs> Sure. So, you know, in looking at um, a selection of garments, assortment planning, you know, where are some areas of opportunity here where having an outside perspective might help? Um, you know, we just finished another episode that, that added complexity to the assortment planning that customers are dealing with today. It's not only taking a look at understanding the balance between core, fashion basic, and fashion those percentages that you're gonna to allocate to a particular type of product in your overall assortment. How many colorways and how many garments make up a good capsule or collection for a season. Um, and a unique added feature, important added element to that is fit and size. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within most launches in apparel, that's, you know, it, we don't typically have a one size fits all solution. There's always either numbered sizing or sport or alpha sizing that comes mm -hmm. into this. And as we start talking about inclusivity, those size ranges get bigger and understanding the importance of who your demographic is, what that niche in terms of the size ranges are, that becomes a very added important component in addition to all the things that we've mentioned. And an assortment plan begins at one point taking as much information as you can from an existing business if it's already in place, analyzing that for percentage of sales to percentage of inventory, how quickly is the sell-off? What know, are the sizes they're selling? What are the, selling? Sizes, what are the colors? You know, and what is the, the percentage of sell-off and size by all mm -hmm. those things? Doing all of those kind of analytical things within that but then distilling the good, bad, and ugly within your assortments, mm -hmm. understanding that no matter how much thought process you go through, we're human beings, we're going to, and we don't have crystal balls, we're going to have learning experiences, we're gonna have things that we thought were okay and will become great for whatever reason, and we'll have things that we think are great that won't be for whatever yeah. reason. And so really stepping outside of the emotion of it, analyzing the business consistently throughout the process. Um, and then, you know, taking a snapshot after the season is over, making modifications for future seasons are good merchant strategies. And that assortment plan continues to be organic. You know, n the numbers part of it, we always talk about is so important and that can be tough for an industry of aesthetics. You know, it's, it's not always the sexy side of it. You've got to really take a look at the, at the numbers because there's a lot of powerful information there. You you mentioned the good, bad, and ugly wall. Sure. I'd love for you to explain that a little bit more. Sure. I think when you, you know, when you're looking at a snapshot of a season, um, you can always take your garments in all of the companies that I've worked with and for. Um, you can always take your range of garments and split it up that way. You know, good is something that maybe you thought it would be good and it is good. Something mm -hmm. that you thought would be okay and it's good. There's a learning curve there. Wow, that particular cover color outperformed my buy. This is the good section. This is things that we need to understand that our particular current consumer demographic is liking mm -hmm. and buying at a rate better than average. The the bad, I, I lump those in two different ways, is that one, bad is, and maybe that's a harsh term, but it might be something that you considered that would outperform the industry average and is not. It's performing maybe at average or slightly below average. There's a learning curve for that. Hey, we had not anticipated this result from this garment, mm -hmm. okay? And so that's kind of in that category. I think anything that's that's underperforming should be kind of in that bad area, but not dramatically underperforming. And then inevitably, there's always an ugly one. There's this yes. thing that you look at <laughs> That you don't want to look at, right? You don't want to look at <laughs> it's too it. Painful. You're like, what was I thinking? And the customer saying, what were you thinking? <laughs> right. you know? And uh, again, uh, 
looking at that and understanding those mistakes builds experience and skill. I think, you know, we talk about this whole consulting thing and, and the benefit of having consultants in your mix from an overall kind of perspective, the right consultants mm -hmm. are the ones that have been there doing this for a really long time. We've made as many mistakes as we could possibly make throughout our career. And as human beings probably continue to make some, but we also, our goal is to help others not make those same mistakes. Sure. And so the good, bad, and ugly is part of that reminder that we all can't be right all of the time. Well, and consultants don't necessarily have that same emotional connection to that project that, yeah. the, that the originator might have. So it yeah. does, that, that can be helpful too. Yeah, and uh, hopefully an objective eye to a degree, mm -hmm. a skilled objective eye. Talking about that eye, aesthetics and design, there's a lot of areas of opportunity here, especially as this world of design is changing, more technology is coming into play. Um, so there's new, uh, uh, there's adoption of this technology, learning curves there. There's all kinds of areas really in which design can use um, some support. Uh, can you kind of further explain some of the areas of opportunity here? Yeah, sure. Um, we've said for a long time that the that this business is now in the hands of the consumer. For many, many years, uh, brands, larger brands would dictate fashion for the masses and the masses would look to that brand and say, they've called it, this is what we're gonna do and we're gonna follow like lemmings. Today, um, there's a lot more interaction, a lot more, I would say our, the customer's much more savvy. They're, you know, when they make a choice on wearing a garment, it comes from more of an educated point of view. And frankly, that goes for everything today because we're so interconnected. We're connected with our phone, constant informational update. And so as someone recognizes that even though we have a point of view as a brand uh, that's extending to the consumer, the consumer definitely weighs in very, very quickly mm -hmm. on that on that decision. So how do how do we utilize technology in helping to vet decisions we might make, how to reduce the ugly and the good, bad, and the ugly? And today, technology steps in in terms of really vibrant and 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 robust three D technology, where we can. We can go out and reach out to our customer and say, we're working on a particular program and here's a 3D image of it mm -hmm. and it looks and feels pretty real. We all do a lot of interaction on our phone. The customer can come back and provide real-time comments. They feel like they're part of that whole conversation. Now you can't, you know, it's challenging to always have them vote on everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll get some consist consensus, but you know, we're human beings. We, we, we agree and disagree on a daily basis, but you will get some guidance on particular decision points that will help avoid some of that ugly. And so some of that design definitely helps in terms of that conversation with the client today. Design also helps teams internally with assortment planning, visualization of what things look like in stores, um, and as augmented reality and things like that mm -hmm. come into place, you really can see a visualization of, wow, is this capsule rounded out? Does it look full enough? Do we have all the right colors? Are we speaking the right message to the customers? We're dialoguing and engaging with them. Are we listening to the customer and making the right choices in terms of the amount of solids to pattern or mm -hmm. you know whatever particular trends going on? And I think that's something that we've never had in the past. It used to be pretty simple sketches and, you know, you never really knew the result till it came out oftentimes. And today that stuff looks astoundingly real. Yeah, you can really make some some key decisions much earlier now. Than For sure, even down to fit, 3D, mm -hmm. yeah, 3D generation will help with fit decisions also. Absolutely. So um, we've gone through design, there's the technical side of it. We've often talked about how the United States abdicated the apparel manufacturing many, many years ago. Wholesale, and, I mean, like on a large format, there's still pockets of manufacturing. Sure, in the US, sure. Right? Um, but there's definitely a lot of um, expertise that is needed in this technical space. We talk about tech packs being the blueprint for production and how important it is to have really good technical ex 
expertise when it comes to great execution of your of your products. I'd love for you to talk about maybe some areas where you've seen some things go wrong and and some interesting call outs in this particular space. Yeah, sure. Um, you, you've already kind of prefaced the whole thing that tech packs are the blueprints for production. I really believe that a very robust tech pack defines what the, the brand or company's expectation is of the manufacturer. Uh, the more clear it is, the better the result, in my opinion, mm -hmm. if you have the right manufacturer. Um, but the challenge that exists today within a lot of organizations, one is bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Tech packs are cumbersome. They take a lot of time. And then they take someone with a pretty high degree of technical know-how or people mm -hmm. uh, that have a high degree of technical know-how. And when we talk about the abdication of apparel wholesale on the large format in the U.S., the education system kind of follows in hand there. If we don't have uh, opportunities for someone to really learn something technically and then step into a manufacturing operation, education does not provide that education mm -hmm. or, you know, schooling does not provide the education for something that's not supported in the U.S. Therefore, we don't have a lot of students or newcomers um, properly trained in the field from a technical aspect. They've got to learn it, if you will, on the job, right? right? And hopefully the company that they're working for supports a lot of travel, which is expensive, but a lot of interaction with factories so that person can learn those things. Yeah. When you're dealing with consultants that have been there and done that over a number of years and stay abreast to technological advances in manufacturing and know which country produces what better than others, especially in a world today that is so complicated in respect to manufacturing, this is a very important part of having someone step in and provide some information because it's there's not a lot of expertise out there in the US. You're making that perfect segue because I really did wanna dive deeper into the manufacturing segment because there's so many things to understand about this space. You know, there's the, the not every country does everything well. Yes. There's, there's, you know. And not every factory is the same. Absolutely, there's new technology, there's new equipment, like understanding, um, you know, efficiencies in manufacturing, yeah. all of these things. The politics um, in the landscape. Right. I mean, we've added all of these things in our industry that have greatly complicated the basic manufacturing tenant. Um, and it makes for uh, an interesting uh, game, especially for newcomers. Mm -hmm. um, newcomers that don't have relationships with factories overseas, that don't have years of experience understanding um, if you're going to vet a new factory, what are the telltale signs that make a good factory right. good and what makes a factory not so good? And how do you keep that relationship? How often are you visiting? What kind of certifications do you need? You know, all these different things. It's, it's a very complex landscape. Absolutely. We do have an episode on vetting uh, manufacturers. So if somebody's interested in diving a little deeper into that particular facet, we did um, a couple of seasons ago, I believe, uh, yeah. produce, produce that, ap that episode. There are so many considerations here, um, you know, in looking at uh, product quality. You know, returns are a big part or a big, you know, a big contributor to um, uh compromising profitability for a company. And, you know, an, a key area of returns is is defects. Yeah. So, you know, really having the ability to, um, to make sure you're doing the vetting that you need to make sure that you're going to get the quality that you are expecting and your customers are expecting are... Putting QA, QC in place to make sure that the result is good. And, and you know, today within the industry, I think overall 69, somewhere around 69% of returns are due to some type of a defect mm -hmm. uh, in the overall industry. And then, you know, I think still we're struggling obviously with size and up to 49 or 50% is exchanged a return for sizing. And, and, you know, the defect thing's interesting because um, people that just get into this game real, think that you know, there's such a thing as a defect-free garment. Um, mm -hmm. I've not seen one. 
I can really find something on every garment that I might particularly say could be done better. But when you break out defects uh, in a garment between criticals, majors and minors, we've talked about that on mm -hmm. other episodes, minors are things that everyday consumers really would, it wouldn't impact the buying, purchasing, it wouldn't cause a return. Majors are something that would cause either a customer not to buy it or a return. And criticals are something that cause good damage. When you look at those different levels and understand that there's resources out there, again, as consultancies, uh, quality, quality organizations that can apply what's called an AQL mm -hmm. um, to it, uh, and AQL comes in different sizes and shapes, just like anything. You can have a very tightened AQL. You can have a more relaxed AQL. You can have a very tight AQL on on majors and a very a more relaxed on minors because there's no virtual impact. But you can kind of tailor these things and understand those things. And having an outside organization with boots on the ground that take mm -hmm. a look at those a, at those quality levels um, are really important. The worst thing that can happen is that an entire shipment comes in to your warehouse or into the US and it's fraught with major issues. Right. One, you've lost the timing for the season, you've lost all of your revenue and you'll lose customer satisfaction. They vote very, very quickly on a one to five star rating. Five they like, one they hate. And if there's a lot of quality, everyone knows it quickly and it just might as well be a liquidation event at that point. So yeah. it's important to identify these quality issues primarily during the manufacturing process. Having boots on the ground within the lines, ensuring that if a sewer has a bad day, they stop the sewing line, they fix that situation. You can't inspect in good quality. Right. Generally, a strong inspection team will edit out defects as they see them, depending on what level, if they exceed the AQL level. But that means reduction of garments that you can sell. Managing it within the line, ensuring that that factory is a good quality producer, they've trained their employees right, and that they have monitoring on a daily basis is really, really important. And then these other functions, these other kind of inspections along the way, just to ensure that a neutral third party is saying, hey, we agree with this or that. You know, finding a partner that has really established relationships that they trust too are extremely important. We have heard some horror stories on this side of, you know, companies trying out different um, manufacturers and uh, finding some surprising challenges along the way. A really interesting case study comes from a client of ours, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin Miller, who is the COO of Mantle. Uh, she has a pretty interesting story to share. Let's hear from her. We had our original manufacturer and things we're going really well with them, um, like the quality of the clothes and things like that. Um, and then about two weeks before our website was actually supposed to launch, they came to us and said, we want ownership in your company if we're going to continue to make your clothes. <laughs> and we were like, whoa, what? You know, we were just not expecting that and obviously did not want to do that. Um, and so that was really really difficult because we were like, well, do we delay the entire launch and like save these clothes? But we had to pay for them. So we decided we needed to launch and sell them. But then after we had the initial launch, we had no inventory. We had nothing and we had no plan for more because we had no manufacturer. So then at that point, it turned into a fight over the designs of the clothes and we ended up not coming away with any tech packs or drawings or anything like that because we didn't want to get into a whole legal battle. And so we really were starting from scratch. And the problem we were running into is no one wanted to take that on. Like I contacted some design manufacturer places and they all said, well, if you don't have design tech packs or drawings or things like that, we don't even want to touch it. We don't want to do that. We will, like, we manufacture clothes, but we have to know, you know, what we're manufacturing. So that was another issue is we couldn't find, you know, a company that would start basically from scratch with us. Like, here are the samples of the clothing and, you know, this is what we need made. And then we reached out to a group for, um, 
just investment to get started. And same thing. They were really interested. They flew us out there and then asked for complete ownership of our company. Will and I have said so many times how lucky we are to have found a design team like you guys. And it's, I think, so important to find people that are good at what you're not good at. Um, because you can't be good at everything. And so in order for the business to be successful, you have to realize that and find the people that can do those things for you and bring them onto your team. Wasn't that crazy? When I heard it, I couldn't believe it. I know. And for it to happen not once, but twice, <laughs> it's just like unbelievable. Yes. You know, we've, we've heard our share of Hey, I went on Alibaba stories, not yeah. to pan any particular company. Um, and I put money out and this is, you know, and I got crazy stuff back. That's not the way to go about business. Right. You know, when you're spending sometimes the amount of a new house or a large house or a mansion, right. you know, you're not going to just use an unvetted supplier. And so it's very, very important to have someone that understands the landscape there. Yeah. So many things to navigate, um, including the waters, the actual waters of getting product from one location to another. Logistics, you've heard us say it, it is just insane these yeah. days. Um, and there's a lot to understand, uh, duties, tariffs, you know, the, um, you know, various uh, political climates, uh, you know, Logistics really is kind of like that planes, trains, automobiles, ships of the entire industry. A lot can go wrong here. And about as crazy as the movie Planes, Trains, right. and Automobiles lately. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's, 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 uh, it's about as chaotic as I've ever seen it. Mm. Um, there is some relaxation today uh, to some costing, but that doesn't mean that's going to be That we permanent. can count on that, right. Um, and, you know, I would say that a terrible nightmare would to do all these other steps right, get a beautiful <laughs> garment, and they're like, hey, you're going to have your stuff stuck in Chicago for six months and miss the season. And right. so, you know, getting it getting it from manufacturer to your warehouse um, is critical, a critical step. And, and again, uh, freight forwarders are like manufacturers. They're not created equal. And so you want right. to make sure that you're using the right team that cares enough to get your goods uh, to you on time. Right. On time being key, you know, it's, you don't want to have to make last minute decisions to, if you've planned on one method of transportation for your goods to now all of a sudden have to pivot and mm -hmm. air things in, or, you know, just the, the cost and how that can really affect bottom line is, is very significant. Agreed. And, you know, consultants are not brought on to make you feel good or to tell you what you want to hear, ideally. Consultants should be brought on to tell you what they know from their skill and experience. And oftentimes we're finding people lately that are being very optimistic in terms mm -hmm. of delivery, not putting in the amount of time necessary, trying to push this quick turn envelope in an environment that fights against it. And the result is if you're going to be too optimistic or try to push your way through all of these things, the result is missing the timing that you need, plan those steps in place, make sure that you've got them, be frustrated by the amount of time it takes in the yeah. process today, but certainly work within that process uh, so that you get your goods timely. Yeah, working with somebody that can really help you have realistic expectations about what is and isn't possible is, is a really good point, Brett. Are there some, um, since we're talking about the value of bringing consultants in to share their advice in some of these key areas of the apparel uh, pro making process, are there some uh, maybe final thoughts that you want to share with regards to, you know, just vetting that right partner? Yeah, certainly that, you know, vetting the consultant, right? Yeah. Because um, all of these other components um, are unique and challenging and some consultants will have a knowledge of more than one of those categories. And some of them will be specialists within one, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, you know, there are times that a consultant can be the end all and manage all those different points, but ask a number of questions based upon that, see how long they've been in the business, you know, really vet that opportunity and understand you could also bring on additional consultants for specific needs up mm -hmm. front 
that might be particularly challenging, particularly unique, um, uh, you know, for, for each organization. It's okay to take your time. It's okay to ask a lot of questions um, because if you're going to listen to them and pay, pay for their knowledge, you want to make sure they're the right partner. Yeah, that's all excellent advice, Brett. Thank you so much for sharing that insight today. If we can help you uh, uh, navigate this very complicated landscape, of course, reach out to us. We have been developing quite a network of amazing consultants actually through this very podcast. We've met some incredible experts out there. So solutions come in community and we're building quite a community. That's right. So thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe. Stay apprised about the coming episodes of Clothing Culture.